My name is Glenn Rabenberg, and normally when I'm giving a talk, I will say, I hail from the great state of South Dakota, but that's not going to mean much here. Uh, last week, I'm, I'm, I should say, I'm, I'm in Kingsbury County, northwest of DeSmet. I'm third generation on our family farm, which is organic, and uh, we have a lot of neighbors that are conventional and chemical, and they say I am a recreational tiller. And we've got some neighbors that say I'm a dirty, rotten, lying, cheating, no good, da, 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 organic farmer because our fields are cleaner than what they feel comfortable with our organic fields being clean. <clears throat> you will hear a lot of talk from a lot of different people as this healthy soil, sustainable soil, the almost religious belief of no-till versus conventional till versus minimum till versus all the different variations. I'm going to try to keep this very simplistic, but yet incredibly important, because I will tell you the stuff that most people won't tell you. That's the truth. And what I, what I mean by that is uh, last week, in fact, Today, one week ago today, last Wednesday, we were in California for the Acres Healthy Soil Summit. And when you think of, of words, one word may have a lot of different meanings to different people. And so when I talked to the group out there after our field tour, said the Healthy Soil Summit, healthy has a definition. And a lot of people say, ah, oh, gee, what's that mean? That I'm not on too many prescription drugs or I just need one crutch or I feel good three days out of seven. What's healthy? We need to define it. The definition of healthy I like is without disease or impairment. Pretty much covers it. So as, as I'm traveling a lot of different places, and most of my time is not spent in South Dakota. Uh, I will get one question asked to me, and this has happened on the continent of Asia, and New Zealand, and Australia, and also in Costa Rica and California. They'll say, what's a guy from South Dakota know about growing coffee in Costa Rica, or citrus in, uh, in California, or grapes in New Zealand, or wherever it may be? It's like, you know what, great question. Great question. When you look at all the different people, we're all people, just like farming is all soil, a lot of different plants, we all have something in common. And if I were to ask each and every one of you separately, what's the most important thing in your life? Everybody would have a different answer. Some guys would say, oh, I got a lake cabin. Or got a new set of golf clubs. One guy said, the most important thing to me right now is my wife. And it never always used to be that way. She goes, we're empty nesters and we got to know each other. And I really like my, my wife. Being from Kingsbury County, I like to keep things simple. If you were to ask me, what's the most important thing in my life? I'd say air. It's something that is overlooked, it's something that isn't talked about, and it's something that costs every grower money. Because if soil can't breathe, nothing good can happen. You'll hear a lot of talk that they'll say, tillage kills microbes. And they're right, it does but suffocation kills a whole lot more. People talk about compaction, wonderful porosity test. This is great stuff. I have a different tool that I use. Anybody familiar with this ever see what it is? A penetrometer, a soil penetrometer. The Amish in, on the East Coast will call it a compaction meter. There's two different tips that go on the end. You can go out into any field, and we'll take these on the field walk, and there's a gauge. And this gauge reverts back to pounds per square inch 
of surface tension, of compaction, or lack of respiration. If you've never thought about soil breathing, it happens. And in the short period of time, I'm going to jump into several different sciences. So we're going to jump from agronomy and soil physiology. We're going to jump into meteorology. The reason we're going to jump into meteorology is, I'm guessing just like you guys, I watch the weather. And I don't know why we watch the weather, because if we've got an old timer in the neighborhood, they can usually tell us what's going to happen more than what the meteorologists can. But looking at the weather map, when you see a great big blue H representing a high pressure front moving in, if you're a pilot or if you're a meteorologist, you both know the same information. A high pressure front is heavy sinking air. Okay, great. The importance of this heavy sinking air is to push air into the soil, deep, deep into the soil. And the deeper that high pressure front pushes deep into the soil, the bigger breath the air can take. What type of pressure in the soil will allow that air to go in? 200 pounds per square inch. And in most fields, we'll put a tip on, and I'll hand this to the, to, uh, the owner or to one of the hired men, and I'll say, watch the gauge, gently push down until you hit 200 PSI and stop. Reach down at the top of the soil, and you will find out what your true aerobic zone is. Beneficial, air breathing, wonderful soil microbes do not appreciate more than 200 PSI in the soil. Feeder roots that, that push through the soil to grab nutrients do not enjoy more than 200 or 300 pounds per square inch in the soil. What's my point? If you're a no-tiller, if you're a chemical farmer, if you're a conventional farmer, if you're full tillage or anything in between, we have a lot of similarities as being farmers. We all need to breathe. Is anyone here not breathing? Okay, this is still the English speaking group. Now, a high pressure front is designed to push air into the soil. Here's the important thing with that, is as we're sitting here, as we're breathing, does anybody smell nitrogen? I don't, because we've been breathing it forever. Every breath of air we take contains 78% nitrogen. Now, no matter what type of farming style you have, in most parts of the world, most growers' largest input is nitrogen, correct? For fertilizer. I'm from Kingsbury County. Now, we may have had something in the, in the water when I was growing up, and I'm sure there were maybe some paint chips in my breakfast cereal in the morning, but I like to keep things simple and think about it. If the air contains 78% nitrogen, why in the wide, wide world of sports do we need to buy any? because that high pressure front is not able to push air down into the soil. So when that high pressure front comes in, if everything is correct, that air will get pushed down deep into the soil. Many times there's a rain event that follows a high pressure front. Following the rain event is a low pressure front. And a low pressure front is exactly the opposite. It's a light rising air that is the exhalation of the soil. Why is this important? Everything good in life has to breathe. Everything bad can usually get along without air. Most companies won't talk to you about air because when air gets into your soil, 
things get healthier. When air gets into your soil, your nitrogen bill goes down. When air gets into your soil, you now start doing something that this wonderful creation called Mother Earth has been doing for many, many years, the carbon cycle. If you listen to the news, they talk about the CO2 levels in the air are at 415 parts per million, higher than ever recorded. This is a horrible thing. It may be, I don't know, but as a farmer, it's awesome. Because the crops that each one of us sell, if we were to take all the moisture out of that crop, whether it be corn or beans or alfalfa or wheat or rye or flax, doesn't matter what it is, all plants are predominantly uh, physiologically the same. Carbon and oxygen make up the majority of the dry matter of any and every crop grown. The biggest deficiency in every crop grown is carbon and oxygen. Carbon and oxygen makes up 90% of the dry matter weight of your corn, your alfalfa, your wheat, your rye, your oats, your beans, your flax, whatever it may be. How many people buy a lot of carbon and oxygen for inputs? No, I don't either. But guess what? If your soil is tight, and not able to breathe, you have a deficiency of carbon and oxygen, and as the, the tightness of your soil increases, so does your nitrogen bill. Now, to give you real-world numbers, in California we did a field tour with one of our growers that is a fantastic manager. And there were 47 people on the bus tour and they were asking him, what's your chemical cost? What's your fertilizer cost? And one of the costs that they asked is like, what's your nitrogen bill? Because these are tree crops. These are olives for olive oil, several different varieties of grapes, organic almonds, organic walnuts, and big users of nitrogen. And the grower says, what do you spend for nitrogen a year? And our grower, Frank, is, uh, isn't a big group person. He looks down and trying to think about how he's going to tell these people how much nitrogen he buys. He says, I'm going to have to tell you a little story. He says, uh, this guy from South Dakota came out with a penetrometer and started poking around the ground. He says, when we first started jabbing my ground, he says, I realized I had an inch and a half of true aerobic soil. He says, I had that much. I see how long the shaft is. I just automatically assume we're a long way from where we need to be. <laughs> he says, in, in three years, we went from an inch and a half to his knuckles now touch the ground. He has less than 200 PSI in almost three feet. They've got three feet of topsoil. Most of us in South Dakota, we got 16, 18, maybe 20 inches, and then we got a clay, uh, clay pan. Out there, they've got four feet of good black soil. This is just south of Sacramento. He says, the reason I tell you this, he says, I can, I can put my knuckles to the dirt at 200 PSI. And he says, the reason I say this, it'll make it a little bit more believable. He says, my synthetic nitrogen bill this year and last year is zero. And, and I'm, watching the, I'm watching the crowd and I get some furled looks and I get some head scratching and... Uh, and I hadn't told him about the air being 78% nitrogen and the high pressure fronts pushing down and low pressure fronts rising up. But here's the thing is, the way I was raised and what I believe is in the six days of creation and by the Garden of Eden, I never heard or read anything about a chemical or fertilizer plant being next to the Garden of Eden. Mother Earth was created 
to be sustainable. There is a lot of money, and I mean a lot of money, squillions of dollars every year spent to universities and groups to tell us stuff that isn't the whole truth. There's many groups, there's many universities that do not appreciate what I do and do not enjoy what I say. But I will tell you, this is true. And the one sales pitch that I have to give you today is I want to sell you on each and every one of you thinking about what is said. Thinking about what somebody is telling you and thinking in a different level is, is what they're saying truly correct or were they paid by a company to give this information? Perception versus reality. There's many different little stories that talk about perception versus reality. I'll give you my perception versus reality. As I was growing up for 18 years, I bet I was told 1,500 times that I was the best looking guy in South Dakota. Yeah, go ahead, that's all right. You can laugh. So my perception is I'm a pretty good looking cat. The reality is no mother wants to admit they have an ugly kid and my mom was no different. So I was told many times. My point being is what some companies tell you or what some companies pay a lot of money to universities is to tell you a portion of the story that will benefit that company. The universities most, most what used to be land-grant universities are not land-grant universities anymore. They're chemical-grant universities. So when a, when a professor gets in front of you and leans in and starts telling you facts and statistics and this and that, politely ask him what company funded that research. Less than 3% of most universities' research is done on their own. In my terms, that's educational prostitution. May not, may not be fitting to say that in a church, but it's real. These professors are intelligent, well-trained, well-educated, and they're not telling us the whole story. How much time do I have, Christy? Uh, about 10 minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay, so today, and there's, there's so many things that we need to look at. I, way back coming out of college, I, I was trained in animal pharmaceuticals and biologicals, and I worked in that area, and I took the long route to the dirt. And what I found is I... Uh, I got a promotion quite a few years after being in there, and, and I got a promotion to this technical director. And I thought, hey, and it was a wonderful pay increase. And I quickly realized why they paid a lot more, because it was an absolutely dirty, rotten, stinking, horrible, miserable job. I got to take samples and autopsies on sick, dead, dying animals, the dirty work for the vets, and then take, take that information or take those samples to the lab or take it to the vet. I did a lot of uh, slaughter checks in, uh, in livestock processing, meat processing facilities. And what I started learning is there's a lot of sick animals that go to slaughter that we don't know about. If you guys raise your own livestock, which ones do you eat? Do you eat the sick ones that are limping with snot hanging out of their nose and, and a mattered eye? No. You, Kill the fatted calf. You go for the good stuff. Why? Because it's our bodies, it's our nutrition, it's our health. These animals we're getting slaughtered were horrible. Much of the plants that go into food is not much different. What I learned is soil, 
soil microbes, plants, animals, humans, basically everything on earth, we all enjoy the same level of calcium, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, sulfur. If you're curious what a microbe likes, or what a cow, or a monkey, or a mouse, or a microbe, or the soil, or a plant like, look at a female reproduction livestock mineral tag. We are all designed to eat from the earth. And the cool thing is when you understand one segment of this beautiful thing we call life, you understand it all. So, the earth was designed to feed all of us. Four feet, two feet, good looking, less than good looking. But we all have several things in common. We all have to breathe. Now, breathing and a heartbeat and romance are sometimes compared to each other. Breathing, romance, and a heartbeat are compared that none of them are important unless you're not getting one of them. So as you think about this, how long can we go without food? If we had to, weeks. I could probably go a little bit, little bit longer because I got some excess. Water, a day or two. Stop breathing for three minutes. Tell me how you feel. You win the lottery. You get the big break. You have the best crop. You have your first grandchild, whatever it is. Doesn't matter what you're celebrating. If you stop breathing, nothing else counts. So in the movement of healthy, sustainable, and all the conversations that, that go with that, today what we're going to look at and what, I, what I'm giving you a sales pitch on is please check your soil to see if it's breathing. Because aerobic, air-breathing, beneficial microbes have to be in your soil. And if they can't breathe, they're not going to do any work for you. This is checking respiration. This is like going to the doctor's office and checking to make sure your lungs are working. Breathing is the most important. The second most important thing is something that happens 80,000 to 100,000 times a day in every one of our bodies. And if we listen, we have a heartbeat. We know that heartbeat is electrical because if it stops, they juice up the jumper cables and, give, and pop you back with a defibrillator. And we know our hearts are electrical because when, uh, after, after they pop you, they put us on an EKG or an ECG, an electrocardiogram. The soil has a heart, or a heartbeat, so to speak, and this is the meter that will measure the electricity. Every mineral in the soil, every microbe in the soil has electricity. Every one of us have electricity in our body, and each of these minerals have to work together to electrically allow the microbes and the nutrients to flow to and through the plant. If you have high magnesium soil, if your neighbor has high magnesium soil that gets greasy, slimy, sticky when it's wet, hard as a rock when it's dry, that's electricity that's making that soil tight. We consider calcium and phosphorus being the parents of all minerals in the soil. So when you look at your soil test, you may see, oh, it has all kinds of calcium. Calcium's heavy and, and moves downward through the soil. And what we find is, I'm not a big no-till fan. We find a lot of calcium in the fourth, fifth and sixth inch of the soil, but the top one, two, three inches doesn't have any calcium in it. And that's where the compaction starts. That's where the crusting, the lumping, the clumping starts. And that's where you start sealing off the soil. The soil isn't breathing. And, and now the problems start coming in 
which the Monsantos, well, the Bears and the Dows and the DuPonts, they're okay with that because they get paid to react to the symptoms. So as we go through the day, this is, this is only just a, a sliver, but it's the most important thing. No matter what your farming style is or, go, or is going to be, please take a look at the respiration or the air. Because healthy soil, if, if you Google, if anybody's got a smartphone, I think everybody does now, Google composition of healthy soil. It'll show 45% minerals, 5% organic matter, 25% water, and that healthy soil should be 25% air. 25% air on the soil matches exactly with this at 200 PSI. I'm sure it's just coincidence. So it has to breathe and it has to have a heartbeat. So I will be here throughout the entirety of, of today. Thank you very much for your time. And, and we will be taking these tools along on the field walk so that anybody that wants to play with them can. And this is all about understanding the soil and telling you things that a lot of companies don't want us to know. Every weed will grow in a specific environment. The pigeon grass, or what some, some Minnesota guys will call foxtail, normally grows in compaction. Canada thistle, musk thistle, the sharper, the pricklier, the nastier a weed is, the more out of balance that soil is. The tillage that was done had broken up all of the stolons and the taps had broken that up. And on a drier year, that soil won't tighten back up. The thistles are growing because there's compaction. And the bigger the thistle, the bigger the compaction. We know this when we first started going out because it's like, I would look, it's like, why are weeds growing here and not there? Why are weeds over there, but not in my field? So I started doing testing because when I started doing soil testing, the soil test showed virtually little difference. And what we found is everywhere there was a thistle patch, there was compaction. The thistles were trying to open up the soil. When the soil gets opened up, the thistles go away. Calcium is a mineral that keeps soil structured, keeps soil flocculated. Weeds do not like available calcium and phosphorus. So in a no-till situation, many times that calcium has moved down through the profile and the weeds are growing to try to bring it up. Pigweed is a, is a weed that will grow in the deficiency of available phosphorus. There isn't a weed, now the other thing is university professors will say, well, a weed is just a plant growing out of place. And I can't disagree more. Those plants are growing exactly where they're supposed to be. They're trying to fix a problem. They are telling a story. And if given time, they will correct it. They will open up the soil. They will bring calcium from down deep, bring it up. They will make more things available. And anybody that's an organic farmer, that's a good looking field of beans. I tell you what. That there's nothing wrong with that. There's a lot of pride right there. For the year we've had, hats off. That's cool. Well, there's a reason we're at this field, not the other one. Glenn, do you want to demonstrate your penetrometer? Ah! If anybody's curious, we've got a, we've got a couple of these. I know on the headlands we drive back and forth. That's not going to be accurate. <laughs> Let's see. You want to do both? I want to see what the What? Well, I didn't even get a chance. He's shutting me down. <laughs> But you just said what I was going to. If you're curious just to see it work, don't use this as an analysis because you know what this ground is getting. But if anybody's curious, grab one and, and go out. It even works with one hand. <laughs> and it's the in, there's two gauges. It's the inside gauge at 200 PSI. Anything more than that, microbes will not flourish and will not be happy. In most cases, this time of the year, these plants are working. And to give you an idea, working, back last spring when you plant a seed, it will grow vegetatively, or what the experts will call anionically. It will grow root, stem, and leaf, and need very few nutrients from the soil. 
it does not pull on the soil. Very few plants pull from the soil until they become reproductive. Once that flower silks, tassels, blossoms, goes into reproduction, now is when the pantry, the soil, the nutrients that the microbes hopefully created during the first part of the, of the spring and summer, now things get evacuated. And that's your biggest limiting factor is how many microbes you had from the beginning and how many microbes you have now and how much food they were able to produce. Here's a misconception that very few people tell you. When you look at a soil test, the calcium, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, and sulfur, everybody focuses on that and everybody says NPK, NPK, NPK. A plant's a whole lot more than NPK. The soil test just gives you minerals that structure the soil. The minerals structure the soil, and here's the key part, so the microbes can grow the plant. There are a small amount of minerals in the, in the plant when you harvest it. When you, when you harvest these beans on a dry matter basis, less than 3% of the dry matter weight will be minerals. Now, if any of you guys get the soybean, the South Dakota Soybean Association, quite a few uh, months ago, uh, South Dakota State University came out and they had this big article that says, the need to feed. And they said, one bushel of soybeans will contain about blah, 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 2.2 pounds of nitrogen. One bushel of soybeans will contain about 0.7 pounds of phosphorus. And they did potassium, they did sulfur. Well, I added them up, what they, what they were putting the big focus on, it didn't even add up to nine pounds. Now, what's a bushel of soybeans weigh? More than nine pounds? Yeah. So how much information did they really give us? Carbon and oxygen make up 90% of the dry matter weight of the plant. That's got to come from microbes. So as we're looking at the numbers, and here's the thing, these numbers are kind of like horseshoes and hand grenades. You get points for being close. There isn't any real exact right number. But what we find is once we get over a 1.0, the beneficial aerobic soil microbes start slowing down. 1.2 on this meter, the microbes are starting to shut down. Now, it, depending on the inputs, depending on the soil, there's a big range. But in most cases, a 0.4 to a 0.9 a 0 0.4 to a 0 0.9 is usually the healthiest range for beneficial aerobic soil microbes. So it is like golf. So it is like golf. We want a lower number. Yes. Not, not necessarily a lower number. If, if you see inconsistencies of the number as you're pushing this down, and this tip is the reader, so as you're pushing this tip down, watch the number. The more consistent, the more stable, or the, the less movement that the meter has, the more biological it is. Just like walking into a big building, and if you go through, say, like a sports auditorium, you go at any level, any room, and it's always the same temperature, somebody did a good job engineering that. The more consistent the numbers are as you push this down through the soil, the biology have been given the opportunity to homogenize that soil to create a rhizosphere zone where the roots can grow and everything's happy and healthy. As the microbes do their job, they decompose and die into protoplasmic gel. That's what they call humus. There's a lot of people talking about organic matter, organic matter, organic matter. Organic matter is just residue broken down once. Humus is organic matter broken down again. So when you look at it, you have to go from residue to organic matter, and you're not done yet, to humus. In a lot of the no-till chemical farms that we, we work with, if, if GMOs are planted, if it's Roundup Ready or Liberty Link, they have natural antibiotic properties to them. Roundup is a patented registered antibiotic. Nothing wants to eat a GMO crop. It will lay there like a turd in the punch bowl. 
So when you, when you take a soil test, scrape away the residue on top and just get the dirt. The, the no-till promoters will say, well, that residue is, is, is soil armor. It's something nothing wants to eat. And when they promote a burn down, this crop is 90%, take the water out, 90% carbon. If you hit weeds or any crop with Roundup, they call it a burn down. The first thing that leaves you is carbon. Carbon goes up, up and away. Carbon is the majority of the plant. Carbon is the bigger, one of the bigger deficiencies in the soil. We are a carbon needing society. And by burning it down, they're burning off the carbon. And these chemical companies know this. The lower the carbon and oxygen in your soil, the more opportunity they're going to get to get into your checkbook. So when we look at this, this is giving the heartbeat of the soil. Most all beneficial soil microbes will carry a half of a millivolt of electricity in their body. As they die, that is the energy that pushes and pulls nutrients through the soil to the plant and through the plant. So if you're curious with this, as you push down through the soil, look at the consistency of the number and then match that with the consistency of the surface tension or how tight that soil is. You've got the heartbeat and you've got the respiration, the number one and number two things that any EMT looks at first when going on an emergency call. Are they breathing and do they have a heartbeat? That's the most important thing to look at in your soil first. Make sense? Comments, questions, did I do okay? Okay. Well, I, I so still, what was the reason? I, well, I still don't understand why the number's different closer to the plant itself and different in the row in between. Wait, say that again in the mic so they can all hear it. Oh, I'm having a discrepancy between the numbers right next to the plant with the root system and the dirt in between the rows. The number is higher between the rows and lower right where the root mass is. So, why? Great question. In most, in 99% of all the fields, at this time of the year, when you probe closer to the plant within the root zone, within the rhizosphere, you will get a lower number because in the early phases of the plant, the plant would be pushing nutrients out the root tips. The experts call this a root exudate. It's the, it's the sugar that is made during photosynthesis during the day pushes it out the root tips and that feeds the microbes so they can mine and break some soil apart for the next day's growth. At the, so earlier in the year, before reproduction, many times your number closer to the plant will be a little higher because the plant is actually feeding the soil and the soil microbes. Now it's in reproduction and it's sucking everything out it possibly can. So when you see beans that maybe don't fill the pot all the way in, or you get some BBs, maybe up on top or down below, you can, re you can relate that back to your numbers. If you see corn that doesn't fill all the way to the end, it probably ran out of electricity. So this time of the year, your numbers closer to the plant will be lower on an EC meter just because it's pulling hard, it's cleaning the pantry out, it's having a party up on top and it's grabbing all the food it can. So that is very normal for this time of year, having a lower number by the plant. And you probably don't have any roots or many roots in the middle of the row. So there's no, no roots to pull that energy from there. So it will be higher. As you structure the soil, it's harder to compact it. And what we're finding across everywhere we work, compaction is the number one problem in most agricultural situations. And make no mistake, doesn't matter what they tell you, every agricultural chemical kills microbes. I'm gonna say that again. Every agricultural chemical kills microbes. Fungicides, herbicides, insecticides, pesticides, they all kill microbes. It isn't the fact if, that they do it, it's how quick they do it. So if you don't have microbes in the soil, 
there will be a lot of problems that companies will want to react to the symptoms of not having air, not having microbes, not having the mineral structure of the soil.